the first video from chapter six really lays the groundwork for what we're going to cover in this second video. Okay. Here we're going to continue to talk about regioselectivity, okay, which we introduced the foundations of in the first video. Get a new reaction, the acid catalyzed addition of water, and see how tricky carbocations can be and why you always have to be on the lookout for these things. Okay. So regioselectivity, right, what does this mean? And a reaction is considered to be regioselective if it's possible in the reaction to make two or more constitutional isomers. Remember from chapter four, that means they're actually bonded differently, bonds have broken and moved around. Two or more constitutional isomers, but one of them is predominating. Either it's the only one that's made, 100 to zero, or even 75, 25, but still considered to be a regioselective reaction, right? Things can be moderately regioselective, highly regioselective, or completely regioselective, where we get the 100 zero that we saw in the first video. Okay. And we're going to use those ideas to predict the major product of reactions. In our case, we're starting with electrophilic addition reactions. And it's all about the stability of the carbocation, right? Here we see two regioselective reactions. Because they would go through different carbocation intermediates, we get major products and minor products for the addition of these hydrogen halides to an alkene. And I recommend, if you want practice for these things, pause the video, draw out the, recommend, the mechanisms, identify the different stabilities of the intermediates and the transition states, and figure out to yourself, right, why are these the major products? So right, here's an example of something that's completely regioselective, where only one product is formed. Here's something that's moderately or highly regioselective. If you get a major and a minor, right? Something that's like 90-10 would be highly regioselective. 60-40 would be moderately regioselective. We're really focusing to start on things that are completely regioselective. We only make one product. And again, we're looking at difference in stability of the carbocations because the Hammond postulate from video one told us that this relates to the stability of the transition state. What's formed faster predominates. But that's not to say that that's always going to be the case moving forward. Here's an example of a reaction that's not regioselective. We get a 50 50 mix here of two bromopentane on the left and three bromopentane on the right. Both of those are obtained by going through a secondary carbocation intermediate. So it's just a 50-50 split. Half the time it's gonna to go to one carbon, half the time to the other. But if there is a difference in the carbocation stability, right, taking primary, secondary, and tertiary, then we do have regioselectivity. That we learned from the first video, and now we can get a name to that. Named after the fellow in the top right with the awesome beard, this is called Markonikov's rule. And Markonikov's rule tells us that the electrophile adds preferentially to the sp2 carbon in an alkene here bonded to the most hydrogens. Okay, so notice that it says the electrophile, right? not hydrogen. Because we only have one reaction so far, we can think about it as being hydrogen. But for laying the framework moving forward and learning other reactions, make sure you remember this as the electrophile. The electrophile adds preferentially to the sp2 carbon that is bonded to more hydrogens because that always leads to the more stable carbocation. So that's what we're going to use moving forward. Here, all right, one quick note before we get into more reactions. Right, sometimes in organic, you see a reaction as right, generally going from reactants to products. That's old news from Gen Chem, right? but in organic, Sometimes we only show things containing carbon and the other things that are involved in the reaction are just written around the reaction arrow, like the solvent, the temperature, non-carbon containing reactants, catalysts, et cetera. Okay, so you'll see about that in just a second. One quick slide for practice. Yeah. Look at these, count the carbons. None of these are ambiguous situations and figure out where the electrophile would add. So now we get reaction number two from chapter six, the acid catalyzed addition of water. And the key thing here is acid catalyzed. Because if you just take an alkene and add it with water on its own, 
notice from the top here, there's no reaction. Because there's no nucleophile, or sorry, there's no electrophile, the alkene is a nucleophile that's present to start the reaction, okay? Nothing that's going to react and add to the alkene, no electrophile, okay? Water's too weakly acidic to be considered electrophilic. Okay? If anything, the oxygen on water is nucleophilic. So two nucleophiles coming together, no reaction. But if I add an acid catalyst, that provides me the electrophile, that allows the reaction to happen. So you have to have both. You have to have the alkene, you have to have water, you have to have an acid catalyst. We use sulfuric acid. Okay. That allows the reaction to happen and the net product is an alcohol. Okay, We add H on one carbon, OH to the other. So HOH, right? We've net added water, the addition of water. It's also called a hydration reaction. Okay. So knowing the mechanism from the addition of a hydrogen halide from the last video, I recommend you pause here and try and draw the reaction out. You get an H plus from H2SO4, and then try and draw the reaction out, at least the first two steps. See if you can figure it out. And the next slide shows us what it's all about. Okay. How does this reaction happen? Well, the acid catalyst gives me the H plus, the proton, to act as an electrophile and form my carbocation intermediate. That's what happens in the first step. I'm showing up here. Then when I form my carbocation intermediate, the water is nucleophilic and adds and attacks that carbocation. Okay. The net product there right, is a protonated alcohol, okay, which is extremely acidic, so it gives the proton back to water. Right? Remember, arrows always originating at electron density right, to produce an alcohol and hydronium as a byproduct, H3O+. And notice these first two steps up here are the same as our first reaction. We just have a new nucleophile, water, here, instead of a halide. The new step here is just the last one, that protonated alcohol losing a proton because the pH of the solution is greater than the pKa of this protonated alcohol. So this is the only new thing here. If you know the general right, electrophile and nucleophiles coming together, then none of this should be really brand new news. And that ties into my study tip that I'll recommend to you moving forward. I don't recommend that you try and memorize the products that you get from a reaction. Right? Look for electrophiles, look for nucleophiles, look for how to put them together. Right? Just like you wouldn't memorize a math problem answer, you memorize the method. So, keeping in mind here that it's the acid catalyzed addition of water. Know the definition of a catalyst, right? They don't get produced or consumed. They don't change the equilibrium. They get regenerated. So you have to regenerate your H plus, which is done right here with hydronium. So moving forward, we can also do the acid catalyzed addition of an alcohol, which would be your third reaction from chapter six, if you're keeping a list of all these, and I recommend you do. This also, right, is acid catalyzed. The only difference now is we add an alcohol instead of water. And while the acid catalyzed addition of water produces an alcohol, the acid catalyzed addition of an alcohol produces an ether. Yeah? But it's the same exact mechanism just has a slightly different nucleophile here, okay? but it's still the oxygen lone pair that's acting as a nucleophile. So again, I recommend you pause the video, try and draw it out. And here on slide 30, we have that information. Right? Same exact first step, second step pretty much the same as well, okay? just an alcohol nucleophile instead of water. And then we deprotonate and get our final product as an ether. Okay? Because again, this protonated ether down here, extremely acidic, pKa of like negative three. So it's gonna shed that proton and give it back to methanol. Okay? Same mechanism as what we had with water. Okay? Just instead of HOH for an alcohol, we have ROH. Okay. Now here's the kicker. And here's the only challenging thing because these mechanisms, as long as you're good with the stuff from the first video should be all right. Most of the same thing. Here's the tricky part that I alluded to at the beginning of the video. Right? Something that's known as carbocation rearrangement. Because taking the information we have so far, right, look at the alkene here. All right, 
I know that Markovnikov rule tells me my electrophile hydrogen goes here and my bromine goes over here. Okay. But notice that that's the minor product. The major product actually has bromine coming off of this carbon. Okay. So how does that happen? That's our unexpected product that comes from carbocation rearrangement. We see another example right here, right? Not putting my chlorine over here, but rather on this carbon. And those come from the fact that carbocations can and will rearrange if they can become more stable. And the keyword is more. Carbocations don't rearrange if they get the same degree of stability. Like it won't go from secondary to secondary, right? But it will go, for example, from secondary to tertiary. So the question is, how does that happen? There are two ways for a carbocation to rearrange. And anytime you produce a carbocation in a reaction, you always wanna mentally check yourself. Is this thing gonna rearrange, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, after I add my electrophile hydrogen to my alkene here, I get a carbocation on a secondary carbon. Okay. And if that were to just pick up a bromine, it forms the minor product. But we get the major product by having a what's known as a one-two hydride shift. Okay. The hydride, okay, because it's hydrogen plus its electrons, so hydride H minus. Okay. Shifts over bonds to this carbon, which moves my carbocation net to this carbon. So notice it's gone from a secondary to a tertiary carbocation. It's gone up in stability, it's more stable. Secondary carbocation was formed first, but then the hydrogen moved with its electrons to make the tertiary group, okay? By a one, two hydride shift, okay? So one and two coming from the fact it's not from nomenclature, Right? It's just the fact that the two carbons are directly next to each other, one and two. Because a carbocation can only ever move one spot, one sigma bond away. It can't just move to a different side of the molecule unless we have a conjugated system, but we'll talk about that in chapter eight. Okay. So a one, two, one, two hydride shift gives me a more stable tertiary carbocation, and that's where I get my major product from after bromide adds to that. But remember, it only ever happens if you go up in stability from primary to secondary, primary to tertiary, or secondary to tertiary. We can also do it by a one, two methyl shift. Same situation, add my electrophilic hydrogen for my carbocation on a secondary carbon. Yep. Now, if there were a hydride here, that would shift first. It's easier to do a hydride shift than a methyl shift. Right, but in this situation, my methyl group moves over right, and forms a tertiary carbocation. And that's how I get my major product. Yep. Again, because there's no hydrogens to move over, like back here, right? Notice I didn't move a methyl. There was a hydrogen, so I did the hydride. But if there's a methyl group and it can go to a tertiary carbon, it'll move a whole methyl group over there to go from a secondary to a tertiary carbocation. Yep. I've already alluded to this. You're never going to move a carbocation one spot away. Well, you can never move it more than one spot away, right? But you're never going to move it to get the same stability. You won't go secondary to secondary. You won't go primary to primary. You won't go tertiary to tertiary, right? It's always got to be improving in stability. I've talked about this already. Carbocation intermediates are common. We have them for all the reactions that we've introduced so far. So whenever a reaction produces a carbocation intermediate, always check yourself takes just half a second to look. Is this thing gonna rearrange? Do any of its neighboring carbons have a higher degree of stability? Always check that and you'll be setting yourself up for success in the rest of the chapter for our additional reactions.